a lot of animals love water. Hi YouTubers. Now when I was younger there was a lovely old guy around on telly, uh, Johnny Morris. And he presented a programme on BBC called Animal Magic. And it was fabulous and I used to love it. And um, he was like a kindly old uncle character. I, I always thought it'd be nice if he was my uncle because my uncles, you know, they weren't that jolly. Um, but he wasn't. Anyway, he was a nice, nice character and he used to do these things like going around pretending to be a zookeeper in, in zoos. It, it became very you know, politically incorrect, uncor really, incor incorrect to, um, to do programmes like that. But at the time, they got me into animals, they got me interested. And however, he's been gone a while now, this dear old Johnny, but there's another Johnny Morris and he has written a book called The Fossil Record. This is Dr. John Morris and he is a creationist. It's not quite the same as, as Johnny, the old Johnny Morris. However, um, Dr. John Morris, who's actually a doctor in mathematics, I believe, um, nothing really to do with the evolutionary sciences, and he has written this book, The Fossil Record, and he says, he's in fact said on, uh, I could play it to you, but it's too, I'll be quicker even if I mumble it through, um, he says, while writing this book, he learnt a lot about fossils, which generally means he knew fuck all about fossils before he started writing it. And he does these lectures for the creation ministries, whatever people, and they are, of course, the same old crap. I have covered some of these fields before and some parts of it. Things like he believes in, uh, you know, obviously with dogs, they all turn out different, and you can have different dogs. But that's not evolution, that's, that's just diversification within a species. So he goes through that. I've done all that before, I'm not going to do that this time. But we are going to look at some of the things they have said and uh, just cherry pick really, because uh, as I say, I don't want to go over old ground. Let's have a quick look at the first bit. What's that? Looks just like a modern dragonfly flying around in your garden. In 300 million years, there hadn't been any change at all. Where is the evidence for evolution? It's not in the fossils. The fossil evidence is for stasis. Got it? Okay, well I'm talking to you now from work. Um, in my, my office there. And so I'm keeping my voice down a bit. I don't want to disturb everybody, but um, having a quick look at one of these fossils that <clears throat> just for fun really uh, here we see um, this is a beautiful fossil it's a, obviously a dragonfly and it's from Solmhofen in uh, Bavaria, Germany and we're looking at about 150 million years ago this is from the same area as Archaeopteryx and we have to remember about places like uh, there we go beautiful beautiful uh, wonderful positive positive um, <clears throat> impression now what do you have to remember about places like Solnhofen um, this is the same place as I say as Archaeopteryx uh, from that Jurassic period it wasn't as Germany is today things have changed tremendously and uh, if you look at, uh, at that area at that time you would really be looking at an archipelago Pelago of sort of small islands and a, a sort of shallow sea. That is fairly relevant to the fact that, uh, but it's nice to know, that these fossils have been around for a very long time and seemingly unchanged, obviously different species. But if you go back to the Carboniferous, you will find the very first dragonfly impressions and they wouldn't have changed that much. True. Yet, they are, of course, arthropods, and arthropods are earlier than dragonflies. We have them going way back into the Cambrian, and we have them splitting in the Cambrian. Even when they first appear, they've already split. But still, arthropods nonetheless. And, yes, the dragonfly, in many ways, 
has never become anything else. It's never needed to become anything else. It's so successful, so widespread throughout the world, it's never needed to. Um, other arthropods, of course, have. And we look at many of these examples that were given in this speech, and you find massive difference in the age of these fossils. If you went back pre-Carboniferous and found a dragonfly fossil, well, that would be amazing. Um, however, if you, if you went back into just the Cretaceous and found a rabbit fossil, that would also be amazing, because rabbles, rabbits hadn't evolved at that time. Um, it's always difficult to explain to creationists this sort of uh, brilliance, really, of evolution. Yes, there are mollusks, for instance, mentioned by uh, Mr. Morris. Mollusks um, that have not seemingly changed since the earliest mollusks. However, mollusks have gone on to evolve immensely. OK, there's still the shelled ones around, and they're still doing what shelled mollusks did. But if you look at things like the ammonites, the squids, um, not even the Nautilus was around today and developed from the Ammonites. Um, if you look at those, yes, they've evolved into different things. You cannot, can no longer put an octopus perhaps in the same bracket as the shellfish from which the early uh, clams, if you like, and things like that, these mollusks, which they started out as. They'll say, Where the, where's the evidence for that? Well, we see the point in history where they start to develop. The, the country of Morocco is just one whole big fossil bed. This, these are all ammonites. Some are coiled, some are straight. But they're all ammonites. They're the same kind of creature. They're like a squid with a shell. And these things... By the way, notice that these pointed ones have a favored orientation. They're all kind of pointing upwards. Um, indicating that there's moving fluids, moving sediments around them and, and orienting them uh, re in relation to the direction of, of current. Uh, this is the country of Morocco. Uh, something watery, something just with dump of sediments, something in moving in a preferred direction, uh, something, I think we're talking about Noah's Flood. And the evidence is for a flood that fits the description as given in Scripture. Ooh. Okay, we'll have a look at one of these plates. Um, a heavy old thing. But these plates are um, of Orthoceras and Angoniotite. Type of ammonite, really, an earlier form. Of course, these, these things go way back um, into... I think they're Devonian. Uh, you're looking at, you know, they, they certainly go back to the 400 million year sort of mark. Um, and a wonderful place. You get uh, Morocco is full of fossils, as said by Mr. Morris. And look at the way they lay out. And they all sort of lay out, don't they? Well, yeah, it looks great, doesn't it? And Morocco in general is full of. Um, these Orthoceras, which are again cephalopods. They were uh, members of the same group as the Ammonites. Um, and we have curly ones and we have long ones. How could the curly ones ever get curly? Ooh. Well, they probably just the long ones curled up. Um, but they did split off and they split obviously into uh, Orthoceras and Goniotides. These went on to be things like Bellamites etc. But the thing is about what he has said about them lying in certain ways and we look at the plate that he shows in his fossil. Well, do you know why they do that? It's because they're stuck on. I know, it's shocking isn't it? But these plates are lovely and they are actually genuine parts of the mountain side that they're pulled out of and they do make them look lovely and of course they do pull out the fossils as well. But to make them interesting they stick them on and we call them fossil plates. Um, so the ones he's got are probably stuck on. Oh, I'll put that down. Right, look. Oh, 
Look at it, it's heavy. A genuine, as I say, a genuine piece of the stone. Now look at this one as well. This is from the same area, Morocco. Um, and if you look very closely where it's been shined, you see how the actual plate itself is absolutely full of fossil. It's a fossil stone. And the goniotites here and the Orthoceras here. Um, if you look very, very carefully, I don't know if I can show you, but you will see, uh, hopefully, a line where these things are stuck on and beautifully polished in. Again, as I say, all parts of the same, same area and put together really just to look nice. But don't think they lay in certain patterns because that is the way they are prepared by the Moroccans. And uh, there's some fascinating stuff that comes out of Morocco. Don't get me wrong, but there is also a fossil industry there. Sometimes they fake things. These, as I say, not fake, but they're just made to look pretty. So, anyway, um, let's go on to something else. Uh, this, is, this is devastating stuff. Here's another one. Um, your inner fish. We belong to a highly specialized group of bony fishes. We are fishes, whether we like it or not. Hmm. Yeah. I was, when we checked in the motel a while ago, uh, the, the girl was there, she said, oh, Institute for Creation, what's that? I said, well, that's creation versus evolution. I said, we're a Christian group that we do creation instead of evolution. We think the scientific evidence supports creation more than evolution. And I'm teaching at the seminar, and we're going to be teaching that you did not come from a fish. Now, I've used that kind of line on hundreds of people, you know, sitting next to me in the airport, and, you know, that's kind of how you start the witnessing process. We don't think you came from a fish. And in almost every case, they all say, oh, I never believed that. Nobody believes they came from a fish. Okay, I think I'll, I'll let Jolly answer this one himself, actually, later on in the same... It's, it's, this is a long speech. I had to cut it down, obviously. Um, it's at least an hour, probably an hour, I think it's about an hour and a half long. But later on, in the same talk, he actually answers his own question. So have a listen to this. And by the way, in the lowest level down here at the bottom, the Cambrian explosion, all of the phyla, all of the basic body styles are there at the start, at the bottom of the Cambrian period. All of the fossils are there, right there, at the start. Even vertebrates are there at the Cambrian explosion. And you and I are vertebrates. We're a special category of bony fish, remember? Vertebrates are there at the bottom in every basic category of everything. Where's the evolution? Ah, oh, there we are. We're talking about the Cambrian again. The good old Cambrian where the uh, earliest sort of fossils are found. Oh, there are earlier fossils. If you haven't seen any of my earlier videos, obviously there are earlier fossils, pre-Cambrian fossils, but they are rare. And of course the Cambrian is, is a, a time of much fossilization. And yes, we do see a chordate line, a sort of wiggly worm type character or characters, or I call them characters, but you know what I mean. The these these creatures and at this time you wouldn't be calling them fish but they are the ancestry of fish and he's asking where the evolution is well that's the Cambrian um, it's from that time those backbone creatures have evolved into all the backbone creatures on earth today and uh, ah, he's answered it himself anyway I'm not, I'm not going to go into that again if you can't figure out what I'm on about on this one, have a good think about it, because that's really what we're about, isn't it? Trying to point out to people how to think. So um, think about that one yourself. Well, this is a picture of the most amphibian-like fish, and that's the most fish-like amphibian. Uh, but these transitional forms are hypothetical. They just don't exist. Okay, you think there's no evidence for, for fish becoming... Um walking out onto land. There's loads of evidence for fish walking out onto land. There's lots of different types of species, lots of different um, changes in, in fins, etc, becoming feet. These are all recorded. What, what have you not been watching? Um, if we go back to an old friend of mine, I've got it, got it here actually, I've done this, shown this one before on one of my uh, earlier talks. This one's actually from the Lower Permian 
um, probably about, uh, I should think around about um, 300 million years ago, 295, 300 million years ago. This one was found in Germany and um, it's a Temnospondyl. Now what's a Temnospondyl? Well this was a group of animals that appeared in the Carboniferous and they continued on. They were of course started off as fish and became very amphibian like believe it or not and they went on for a very long time they didn't just uh, suddenly become um, amphibians and disappear they carried on for a very long time um, as I say this one was from uh, the, lower, the lower Permian but its ancestors had already walked out onto land and it does look amazingly, uh, even the, t the thickness of the tail and the, the development of the fins, it's obviously something that lives in shallow water. You see today things like mudskippers. Mudskippers obviously were not part of those, uh, those, those original walk out onto land um, group, but they fill in the same, exactly the same gap that was there then. And they have evolved to live mostly in sort of uh, mangrove swamp type areas, tidal mangroves where they can survive out of water and in water at the same time. Fabulous. Why couldn't animals have done that in, in some of the earlier fish? In fact, it was easier for them to do it then because uh, there wasn't quite so much predatory life ready to get them. So, um, obviously, that is another gap that was filled at the time. I can't see a problem with that. I can see the evidence in the rocks of these animals. Why can't you, Mr. Johnny Morris? Anyway, get back to you. There's another snake. Here's a turtle. It seems to me this take snakes and turtles could be an excellent test case for evolution because if evolution is true, then snakes and turtles, they each evolved from something else. But the question, what non-snake evolved into a snake, the same question, what non-turtle evolved into a turtle? I mean, there's just, it's just different. It's different. They say, well, the ribs just got thicker and thicker and thicker and finally fused together. Well, they can say it. But where, where's the evidence? Where are the transitional forms? We see a lot of turtles in the fossil record. They fossilize well, obviously. And they're, every time we find a turtle fossil, you know what it is? It's a turtle. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> In 2008, that's long before uh, Johnny Morris did his uh, video here, there was the un uncovered a fossil. Uh, the fossil of Odontocles uh, Semite Stachia. And I'll, I'll obviously put a picture of this up. Um, 220 million year old fossil from the lower Jurassic sort of period. Um, and its name means uh, toothed uh, half-shelled turtle and what it shows this fossil and it's a very important fossil is the underside plastron that's the the lower shell lower shell part that formed before the uh, the ribs and backbone developed to form the uh, upper carapace of the turtles what we have is an intermediate form of turtle and it is an intermediate form once again. It was often a mystery how the turtles, Shalonians if you like, freshwater ones we call them, terrapins in Britain, if they walk on land, which obviously they did move to land, um, although originally came from the land into sea and back onto land again with the tortoises. I know in America all turtles seem to go under the group turtles, um, but we're a bit different over here, but the Chelonian group. Uh, colonian group depending on how you say it okay so we have evidence of how they developed and they did develop in water from a land-dwelling reptile and it totally ignores it it totally ignores this and yet the evidence is there if you bother to look at it uh, I'll say no more on it Here's, uh, actually, we have this fossil on the wall at ICR. If you're ever down there, come visit us. Uh, this is a really nice fossil. This is, this is a fossil of a dinosaur. And it's right next to a fish, a, a sturgeon-like fish. I, mean, 
I don't know what a dinosaur is doing next to a sturgeon. Well, I think they were buried together. They didn't live together, but they're buried together. But even that sturgeon, you know, when a fish dies, it just looks like a dead fish. It looks like a dead sock sitting there. But when a fish is alive, it's twisting and twisting, and this is twisting and flipping and, and just got trapped in a flip position. Uh, this is not an easy death for that sturgeon. And the, and the, the, uh, the dinosaur, he's reaching back for air himself. This is a death zone. This is a, a horrid death. What you're looking at is just horrid stuff. By the way, Archaeopteryx, the, the poster boy for evolution, uh, essentially every Archaeopteryx fossil is doing the same thing. Every one of them arching back. They, and these are birds. But, but it's, you know, they, they're crow sized birds. They're not dinosaur sized birds. They're just little crow sized birds. But every one of them is arching back, gasping for air. Every one of them. Every one of them. How many is everyone? That's all of them. I mean, there's a trend here, I guess. And you're looking at a, a thing that was buried alive and died by drowning. Drowning as sediments piled up around him. Man. I hope this, this not only gives you a feel for how creation is, is superior to evolution, but it also should give you a real appreciation for the horror that was Noah's flood. I mean, this was a kill episode. It was a death episode. Uh, this was a judgment of sin. And how much does God hate sin? He hates it this much. Oh, man. Actually, I think he hates sin this much or that much. But seriously, um, just take a quick look at this other bit I did. Okay, I've got something to show you here. It's, uh, this is a Ketchia saw. Uh, a saw. Oh, I can't see what I'm doing, so I'm going to have to stand up. Um, as you see, the very long neck, uh, the head round here. See how close I can get that. Try and get some light in. Uh, but as you see with this specimen of Kitchiosaur, it's a it's had some repair work, but it is a very nice specimen and it's laid out beautifully. Now I've seen quite a lot of Kitchiosaur specimens. They're not particularly rare fossils. They were forerunners of. They're still rare, but they're not not as rare as many. They were forerunners of the Plesiosaurs. Um, at least they believed to be quite small. They lived in shallow um, shallow areas, probably in the same way that uh, turtles do in, in shallow waters today, and we see long-necked turtles. But as you see with this specimen, it's not gasping back with its head back. Now I have seen specimens of these that do have their head pulled back and are gasping for, look like they're gasping for air or something, but uh, having such a, a long neck um, and living in watery areas, which is why they survived so well. Um, the fossils at least, not the Ketchiosaur. In streams, in waters, in rivers, the neck, which uh, would naturally be uh, go with the muscles becoming relaxed, would be moved about by the streams, etc. And quite lucky to have this one laid out. Now, as I say, there are quite a few fakes of Ketchiosaurs around, which is something to be careful of. But as I say, this one is a genuine one. It has had some repair work, but uh, just, just to let you know. And these come, these were around, around about 215 million years ago. Uh, this one comes from China. Uh, and as I say, uh, they show all the features of being semi-aquatic. They have paddle-like feet, long necks for reaching up for air, etc. in shallow waters and would have been predatory. They had longer teeth at the front than they did at the back and were probably fish catchers for small fish etc. Um, anyway, that's a catchy saw. The thing is, we get lots of specimens like this from all over different timescales, different periods and yes, the necks sometimes are laid back etc. Uh, it doesn't mean anything really. Most of the Archaeopteryx um, specimens, I think there's about eight, uh, do have their necks 
uh, backwards, as it were, in, in a death pose. Um, not necessarily all of them. Anyway, we'll go into that later when I'm not at work. Um, so, uh, back to you soon. <laughs> this is actually one of the funniest parts of the speech. How can you determine what is the correct death pose, especially when something's been moved about, been, especially if you look at something like Archaeopteryx? Living in an island archipelago near a shallow sea where, where fresh water is meeting uh, with salt water and at least I assume, yes it is, yes, yes, um, because of the animals we found within it. It's surprising that there are so many Archaeopteryx actually found, as I say about eight, but these were ones that fell into the water and as they fell into the water they did obviously get covered quite swiftly uh, with uh, sediments, which is not surprising in an island archipelago with fresh water heating, um, as I say, probably tidal as well. So there would have been plenty of silt coming from the land. Now, look at the look at these birds, for instance. Uh, look at a modern bird. Uh, if a modern bird dies, the sort of poses you're going to see um, for that. It's ridiculous to assume that you would know exactly how it, a, a bird was going to die and and the exact pose is something gasping for air. You're not looking at these animals. You're looking at them lying flat on the ground. Their necks, obviously, some, with some of them have been pushed backwards. But you're not looking at something standing upright with its neck reaching out like out, out of a so-called pit, um, a quicksand pit or something like that. These things have, have died and the bones have moved. Um, eventually, of course, they've come to rest in a certain position. It's ridiculous to assume anything else. Unless you have some evidence for it. Anyway, it's not something uh, I would I would actually advocate as as a uh, good theory. Last bit we're going to show you, and it's something creationists are so bad at, and that is answering questions. It's just really one of the final parts of his video, and uh, I'll leave you with that. Uh, I hope I haven't gone on too long and bored you too much as usual. But uh, peace for now, and. There's a lot of this video I've missed out because, as I said earlier, I've covered a lot of it before, but uh, Mr. Johnny Morris, and I'm sorry about the, if you can hear the gnawing of my dogs on a chew over there, but Mr. Johnny Morris, if you have any questions and you want me to um, look into any of the other of your theories, then I'll be more than happy to do it. Um, but as always, I don't expect you'll bother with me. Peace. Uh, we did start a little late. John said to me beforehand, if I go a little over time, uh, I don't have to take any questions, right? Well, yeah. Uh, how about one question, John? Will you take one question? I'll take one question. Okay. Who's got a good question on the fossil record? If I get to decide whether or not it's good. 